Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for coming after the, the coffee session before. I hope you're all energized now. Um, so I've given this talk before, full disclosure, um, at other conferences, and it has been between one and a half and three and a half hours, uh, a bit more extensive. So now I have like 40, 45 minutes. Uh, so for me, this is just saying hi to you guys. Uh, but I, I hope I'm gonna, I can give you a glimpse into how we can address reproducibility uh, in computing, especially in software engineering and programming language research. Um, and for that, the talk is, or the tutorial is gonna go like this. I'm gonna st start off with a little bit of a more abstract conceptual notion of what reproducibility is. And the more the talk progresses, I'm gonna go into very concrete instructions as to what you can do uh, on, a, on a higher level, but also on a very low level, what commands you have to type in into your bash to actually get this done uh, with containers. Um, so let's start with, with some definitions that we find online. Let's start with something that we all know, Wikipedia, it's uh, something we, we can give to, to uh, even non-scientists and say, hey, if you want to know about reproducibility, uh, what Wikipedia says is it's the ability to, to uh, duplicate an entire experiment, to take something someone did before, an experiment of some sort, and someone else can take this uh, information and reproduce, so duplicate that experiment. That's Wikipedia. Um, and yeah, they also say that reproducing also means replicating, kind of synonymous. And then if we go to more scientific, let's say, uh, um, venue, nature, uh, who they deal with a lot of reproducibility issues in other uh, disciplines rather than computer science, they say that no research paper can be considered the last, the final word, right? If you do something, this is not the last word in science. Someone else needs to be able to recreate that fact, to reproduce that result. And uh, so what they uh, specifically say is, replication and corroboration of research results is key to the scientific process. So I hope I can, I have convinced you now that this is super important. And if you look into um, one of the software engineering papers that I found on this topic, so, so how can we do this for software development or software engineering research, what they say is a repeatability of a certain uh, process means establishing a fact. So if you do some sort of experiment in the software engineering or even programming language community, you're establishing a fact uh, related to your research, related to the experiment you're running, for instance. And uh, this fact has to be established under um, a certain environment and a certain process, a certain workflow. So that's what they're saying in this paper, and I, I, kinda, I can feel about that. So if you look at the scientific process in, in more general terms, uh, usually what you do is you start off with the hypothesis, uh, you design some experiments, and, and then reproducibility comes in when it gets into how do we collect certain data points that we need, how do we do, do the analysis on those data points, and something that's not as bold here, but it's also blue in that sense in my slide here, is uh, how do we interpret those results? Because analysis and collection of data is one thing, the other thing is how do people actually um, establish so, some sort of notion of, of what this means in terms of, of uh, what the result actually should entail. So I, if you look into more uh, standard uh, literature on this, collection analysis is what reproducibility is all about. I would say that interpreting results is also part of it. So if, you, if we kind of want to sum up this, no, reproducibility is about establishing facts. Yeah. So what are the steps and methods to establish those facts? Uh, and in, in especially in computer science, software engineering, programming languages, is it's about sharing computational knowledge. Right? The second one that is probably the most important when it comes uh, to giving out something like uh, replication packages is controlling the environment. And this can go to a certain extent. Controlling the environment is about execution environments. Let's say it's about, you know, fixing the version of the JVM. It's about uh, fixing the versions of certain dependencies you have, and this is important. Uh, controlling the environment could also mean providing a data set that is a snapshot of some, something at that point in time. Let's say you do uh, analysis on stack overflow posts, a very nice topic that, that's in software engineering. Then you cannot uh, have a snapshot of the whole internet, but you can, you can pass on a snapshot of what has happened in that point in time uh, for the aspect you were looking at for instance. The other one is providing data. Let's say you have a lot of data that you collected wi within your experiment. 
uh, providing this data is also part of reproducibility, so that other people can take the same data and get the, the same conclusions. And in the end, uh, I emphasized this before, uh, the need to be a low barrier to replication. So if, if you pass on a lot of data and information uh, on how you got to get your experiments and, your, and everything else, but then it's super, super hard to comprehend your results or uh, interpret what you were doing, then the, this is also not, I would say it's also uh, not an ideal way of, of uh, providing reproducibility. So, but just, you know, giving out your code on GitHub, but no documentation whatsoever on how to execute that, um, maybe no one will, will actually be able to reproduce it. So, in more specific terms now, if you're looking to software engineering and programming languages research, uh, what we want to share is algorithms and computation analysis. Sometimes we develop a programming languages or tools and prototypes or some quantitative evalu evaluation on, so on some artifact that we have. And in the end, what I said before, it's about internal knowledge. It's about that one thing that one PhD student or that one postdoc knew about how to, to get this running to make things reproducible. And um, in the last couple of years uh, in the software engineering community and even longer in the programming languages community, uh, this has been uh, encouraged by saying, okay, if you make your s research more reproducible and you make your artifacts more accessible to other people, we're going to give you some badge. So, so it's a bit of a gamification um, approach here. So this has been established at, at FSC and MSR in software engineering and all the programming language uh, conferences that I know at least, PLDI, Popple, Oopsla, you get this nice little badge where it says uh, you're doing something valuable for the com community. I think this is good. This is nice. The current state usually is that um, what people usually do is you share artifacts on some public platform. This can be your website, which is uh, in our case, for instance, the, the two projects that we, we did. Uh, and uh, if you do have some kind of prototype or tools uh, and you're not embarrassed to share the code, then you put them on GitHub or Bitbucket or something similar. Or you can have a, like, a downloadable zip. And this is already something that's, that's good enough for, for the start. And throughout this tutorial, I want to talk about one particular example that uh, we had in our lab. Uh, th just a quick word here. This, is, this project is called Change Distiller. And for those of you who don't know it, it's a research project started about, I would say, nine or ten years ago in, at the University of Zurich in, in our lab. And what it does is it, it takes um, the Java source code of, of a project and then the, the next versions of that project and establishes uh, graph transformations between them so we can have a, a change graph between the versions. I mean, very nice little project. Um, and based on this project, I want to talk to you uh, why reproducibility is actually hard. And why do certain things fail when we want to make things reproducible. And uh, one of the things that I, I found online, and I thought this is really to the point, I'm uh, just going to read it here. Uh, so Ian Holmes is a researcher, uh, I think, in biology, and he said that you can download our, our code from this URL, right? Uh, good luck, luck downloading the only post that can get it to run, <laughs> right? So the issue is that you can provide whatever data you want and whatever information you want. Uh, if it's not um, applicable to someone who has the knowledge, this, this internal knowledge, it's going to make it hard to be reproducible. And number two, this is a, a paper uh, called Measuring Reproducibility in Computer Systems Research. Uh, and they went through a couple of years of, of, um, of papers and uh, tried to reproduce, tried to even just build the software. And uh, it's a, a nice distribution here uh, as to why things uh, didn't work out for them. Uh, we, it goes from incomplete documentation, didn't really know where to start building that stuff, uh, to missing third-party packages, to uh, runtime errors, right? Oh yeah, I so if you have any questions, please just shout out. So yeah. I, I have no idea. <laughs> Oh no, I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> this question? S same question? Okay. 
right. No, so, so I was more focusing on the on the over 10% parts. But yeah, you're absolutely right. What what is none? They they probably don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So let's have a quick look at, as to why change distiller uh, might be might be difficult to build nowadays. Um, it was a project that started in 2006 and was developed until 2009, and um, since w and I'm going to assume that 2009 it, it it still worked. I just started my undergrad that year. Um, so, uh, how many Java versions have passed since since 2009 to now? Three. So exactly right. Three, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, is this stuff still working? I don't know. Um, so the dependencies, uh, we're lucky in this case, are all defined uh, in the Maven repository, uh, in the Maven pump file, but are they still in the repository that we need today? And uh, the other thing is, how does the analysis work? What is the entry point to the analysis? I mean, there's a bunch of Java files. Uh, if we're lucky, we find like one main method in there, but how does the ana analysis actually work? What's the entry point to the whole thing? So those are some kind of questions that, that you might be asking if you find uh, some code on some research project in some repository. And the issue here, there's, there's some challenges that we have here. And the one challenge is that there, there's no standard way of describing experiments. There's no standard way of describing what our workflows are, um, where our environments come from. There's no, there's no standard body saying you have to exactly do this to make your research reproducible very ad hoc, basically, in the way we do this. And uh, there's no actual transparency in creating this environment th that we need. Even if you have a VM, so in, in the best case nowadays, wh what you have is a VM, which is very similar to containers. I'm going to come to that later. Uh, but then you don't know how, how you come to the point as to which the, the software needs to be running. So if you want to actually change some little part of it, or want to continue the research that has been done before, uh, there's no transparent way of how this environment has been built up. And, I mean, let's, let's be honest, research is not software engineering. The way we build research code is not the way uh, you should maybe build code, build software, right? It's very experimental in nature. Uh, we try stuff out, we, we add some more code, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, it ma this makes things hard to build. Many things are undocumented. Many things are not automated because you know that one poster knew exactly how, to, how this works. So, uh, so the nature of, of us being in research makes this whole package harder. And of course, I, I think that's is actually um, number one list why I wasn't able to build a, a lot of the software in the past. Uh, dependencies were were unresolved or undocumented. That was my main issue so far. And in the end, what, what is also missing, um, even if we do have VMs or containers, right, um, some infrastructure for distribution. So even if we have all this stuff, where do we put it? If you put it on GitHub, is GitHub going to be available in 10 years? Maybe 15, 20 years? Maybe not. I don't know. So um, this, is a, this is a question where I don't have a solution to, by the way. Just going to pose out some, so some food for thought here. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Sure. I think that this the storage part is is uh, a major challenge here. So I if they solve this, but they only solve it on this uh, small scale. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but given all those challenges, uh, I'm not going to say I have the solution, but I can show you what one of the solutions might be. And he, and here uh, is where this whole topic comes in with containers. So I made this Docker small because I don't want to advertise a company. Docker is also an open source um, software, basically. You can download the sources. You can, you can con contribute to that. 
Um, so this is not a shout out to the company itself. It's a shout out to to um, this open source community that, that is also behind it. So in a nutshell, what? Oh, so maybe just a quick round. Who knows about Docker? Okay. Quite a few people, that's cool. Who has worked with Docker before, like hands on? Okay, not too many, so some surprises. All right, good. So in general, what Docker is, is it allows you to package an application with all its dependencies um, and its execution environment into one standardized unit for software development. So that means it contains the code that you have, it contains the runtime that you need, the tools, the libraries, everything is packaged into one unit. Yes. Whatever you can install, yeah. I mean, I can kind of come to that. There are some limitations. Or, or what, what do you have in mind? Yeah. I'm going to come to that in like a second, yeah. So what, what could that mean for software engineering, programming languages research? It means that our prototypes, our proof of concepts, our analysis ex and experiments, uh, could be packaged up with all the dependencies in this one standardized unit for reproducible research. So we could, you could use the same thing that all the software engineers out there are crazy about. I mean, it's a bit of a hype, let's be honest. Uh, we can use the same thing for, for research. So um, in the next, let me see, how much time do I have? 30 minutes? Oh, cool. So the next 30 minutes, uh, I want to show you some more detailed instructions as to how can we, uh, how can we make this happen for research. So exactly what you said before, uh, oftentimes containers or especially Docker containers are called lightweight VMs. Um, so the difference is that, that in containers you don't have a hypervisor. You, you're not, you don't need to, to um, emulate um, the layer between the actual operating system and the guest operating system. And that makes the whole thing a lot faster. What you do have is a layer in between called Docker engine that is basically just, uh, um, let's say, a bit of a proxy slash, uh, how do I say it, fully correct, uh, <laughs> is, is a nicer usability layer to what uh, Shroot actually is. So if you sh know Shroot, or change Shroot, whatever you want to call it, is a it creates an isolated process. For one process, it uh, creates an isolated environment. So it seems like that one process and all the sub-processes of that have their own root directory. So it isolates the process, has its own process space, its own network interface. So the whole th thing feels like a VM. You can even, uh, you don't have to SSH into it, but you, you can jump into it, into the container, and it feels like you're in, in, in your own server, in your own VM. Uh, the thing is, you share the kernel with your host, right? And so in the past, what that meant, so the, uh, Docker is nothing super new. Containers have been around for, 15 years now or so, um, OpenVZ, LXC, for instance. But for those of you who have tried to work with that back in back in the day, it was a usability uh, nightmare. And it was very hard to get things running with LXC, for instance. And and that's where Docker comes in. Uh, and a bit of props to the company in this case. They made con containers uh, good for the masses. Usability has increased tremendously with Docker as compared to other container technologies. So the engine that I talked about before, this centralized layer that just communicates to the kernel, that is makes it a lot faster than a hypervisor because you don't have to emulate you know, the guest OS and stuff like that. Uh, it's a centralized runtime. It enables the portability because now it also works for Windows and Mac. Um, and it's the only dependency you have to get Docker running. So there's no emulation layer. Thus, you have almost no performance impact. A lot less as you have with VMs, for instance. So uh, the benefits of that, if, even if you compare it to VMs, is that it's very, very fast. Even if you have a large container, um, startup time of a, of a container when you already have an image is between one and three seconds for, for most containers out there. You almost have native performance because you, you, uh, you go directly to the kernel. Uh, you have a transparent build process with something called Docker files. I'm going to come to that in a second. You have a bit smaller images uh, with, with Docker, but that has changed now, actually. And um, it's easy to build, share, and publish because you have a whole ecosystem of, uh, of tools coming with Docker. So that's a nice thing about Docker, actually, as compared to, to VMs and to 
of a container technologies. So let's see what, how this actually, yeah, please. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 it, it would, it would. So if you're very performance sensitive, uh, Docker is maybe not for you, or any container technology. So if you're, very, if you're in high performance computing, for instance, uh, I'm gonna point to a paper later that analyzed those trade-offs there. It's still better than VM though, though. but I mean, understandably. <laughs> so if you look to, to um, the Docker workflow and how it works is, you start off with a Docker file, which is a declarative uh, textual format of how to build your environment and your dependencies and so on. Um, when you build this Docker file, you get a Docker image, that, and that's an immutable artifact. And this Docker image can be run to be made into a container. And the computation happens in the container. So the image is just the compiled version of this Docker file, which is a textual representation of your environment and your dependencies and your software itself. Uh, the image is immutable, and then you can run the container with some parameters. Parameters uh, usually are environment variables, for instance. Absolutely, uh, it is. It is the image. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, very qu quick rundown on the terminology. We have this Docker file that that is the textual definition. We have the image, which is the immutable artifact. The container that is the actual execution environment. So the instantiation of this image. Uh, Docker machine now is a bit obsolete. This is uh, still legacy. So Docker machine was a very lightweight VM that contained like a 20 megabyte Linux uh, to run this stuff. Now uh, Docker runs natively on Mac and Windows as well. Yes? Uh, you would share both, I would say. Uh, but the thing is that in the Docker file, you have the textual dependency, right? You can say, go to this Maven uh, uh, repo and get me this artifact, which is great. Uh, I think this should be there as well because it makes it more transparent. But let's say we're 20 years from now and that particular Maven server doesn't exist anymore. If you still have the image, it will still work. If you only have the Docker file, it would try to get this dependency from that Maven server and it wouldn't work. Okay. Um, and the Docker registry is um, something that Docker itself offers as a as a, a hosted service, but many other uh, vendors actually have a registry where you can push images and you can pull images. So let's have a look. Yes. you use the version from today? I cannot guarantee it for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's uh, the open container initia uh, initiative. Uh, so there's IBM involved and Microsoft involved and I think Google is involved and they tried to standardize the container format. So even if it's not Docker, for instance, it, it can be Racket, which is uh, from, from CoreOS, and they're trying to, to find a standardization for that. But uh, container wars are still going on, so I can't really say more about that. So if you look at a Docker file, let's go step by step and, and see what that actually means. So you start off with a ba base image. You say from, in th this case Ubuntu with version 1204, is the base image. And now if you build your own image, this can be a base image for other people. So then you can have some hierarchy of, of images basically. Then you go on and have your dependencies. So everything that comes after run is just a bash command. And then you, you can install your dependencies. 
Uh, you can compile your software and so on and so forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that I mean that's because now we have Docker for Mac, so that's a emulation layer for that. Uh, so you install your software. Uh, now volumes are, are something special. I'm going to come to volumes in a second, but basically it's a dependency to data, data in a sense of file system, for instance. Uh, th there's a very very small penalty, but it's it's. Very, very small. Yeah. How about the other stuff? Is that like the radio waves that get the power of the data to the system? Can you repeat that? Sorry. Is the transfer stuff the other stuff as well? Uh, so they abstract away from that, as far as I know. Uh, but I have to, to look it up later. So maybe we can talk later about that. Uh, so expose opens the port. So let's say you're, you're offering a, uh, a server, basically, you can open the port uh, with expose. And then you can start your service or your server uh, with entry point and CMD. And the entry point here, I think, is very nice because it shows you how can you use the service, how can you use this computation, basically. And data volumes, uh, I briefly uh, sketch on that, is a volume within a container is a specifically designated uh, folder that has a dependency to a file system. And mostly it's the host where the container is running on but it can also be, you can mount a directory from somewhere else, basically. So the point here is that you should not uh, have anything stateful within the container. So the container is there for computation. If you do need data, you have to define it as a volume. And then you can do what you want. The, the reason for that is that uh, containers are um, a union file system. So for every, let's go back quickly. So for every line we have here, we build up a new layer in this file system. If you, if in the container then we would work with data and change data that is not in the volume, we would increase the, this file system basically, so every layer of this file system. So what you do is you have a volume where you say ignore that part, ignore that folder, so that you can work with data there. Right, okay, so now we move on from Docker files to Docker images, and that's very simple. You say Docker build minus T, uh, you give it an image name, and then you provide the folder, in this case dot, usually you go into the folder where the docker file is, and then you build the image, and that is called the build context, because there are all the files and all the configuration that you need to maybe copy into the container. Yes? No, you, you should provide data as a different form, basically. You Um, I mean, I understand the, uh, layer here, right. Sure. So what happens in that case is you can have your own data container. And so the volume can be pointed to that other container. Yeah. So if you type Docker images, you see a list of images. If you type, uh, you can remove those images. I have to move a bit faster now. Yeah. Um, and in the end, the, the whole where the whole magic actually happens, where the computation actually happens is when you say docker run. And here, I'm just going to point to one typical example of how to use run. There is a whole reference for that. There's a, a lot more configuration that you can do here. Uh, but you start with uh, some parameters. In this case, I say docker run with minus D, which means detached. And this is usually used if you have some sort of server, right? If you uh, s start a long running process and, and you can communicate with that, you start a detached uh, container. Uh, you should give your container a unique name with dash dash name. If you don't, I mean, I recommend you that, that you don't at some point because then you see that they generate very, very funny random names. Uh, and then you have to do some port mapping. So the expose we saw before in the Docker file uh, that is the internal port, which in this case uh, would be 5,000. And then we map it to an, to an external port, in this case 80. So for instance, let's say you have a scalable ser service and you might have uh, 10 containers running for that. The internal port can say the same, 5,000. And then for the external port, you can provide different ports depending on, on your needs. And 
I mean, d this is just for you for reference. If you want to download the slides later, um, those are the most important, I would say, um, commands. How you, how you list all containers that are running, how you list all the containers, even the ones that have been stopped, for instance. Uh, how you stop a container, remove them, and very important, just, just a hint, if you remove a container, you also have to remove the volume independently. That's super weird. I don't know why, why this is the case. But uh, just removing the, the container itself does not remove the volume. And that results into um, basically having a lot of volumes in one specific folder that Docker finds um, is, is important for that. And then you have a bunch of volumes that you have not been removed. So just think about removing the volumes if you remove co containers. And for debugging, what you can do is you can say inspect, and then you get some low-level inf information on that container, uh, something like what IP address has been assigned, what kind of environment va variables do I have in that container, stuff like that. Um, oh. You can say Docker logs, which gives you uh, everything that has been um, written out to standard output and standard error. And with docker exec minus ti and then bash, we can really go into the container and do stuff in the container, assuming it's running. If it's not running, if, if you have a container that just does some computation and then stops, if you still want to debug it, uh, that there's one hack basically where you can say uh, dash dash entry point bash, and then you start the whole computation, the whole container, with you going into the container. And you can then debug. And this, just a quick uh, screenshot, this is the, the Docker Hub by Docker. Um, it's, this is also an open source service, and other vendors ha have actually installed that. And you can install the same uh, locally on one of your servers. So then you can push your images to one of these Docker registries. And uh, yeah, so right now, if, if you install Docker, you can say Docker pull engine, engine X. And uh, Engine X will be the reference to the Docker image. Uh, and re images can have tags. So you can have a tag for, for the versions, for instance. Right, so if you go back and do this whole process that we just talked about, this whole workflow, and let's apply this to change the seller. How can we make this project, change the seller, um, reproducible? So let's start with the Docker uh, file. Sorry, simple Docker file. I wanted to keep it uh, low key. So here we have a base image. In this case, it's not Ubuntu. We can start with Java, uh, the OpenJDK 7. Okay, so we don't have to deal with installing OpenJDK. This has already been built by someone else. In this case, it's even official. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will be Ubuntu probably. I mean, you have to. You can look. So you can go to. Uh, if you say Docker pull, then it it pulls in all the images, and you can see what the, the top level images are, basically. But uh, there's even like a utility where you can say, what, are the, what is the hierarchy? And then it, it uh, tells you what the hierarchy is. But usually, it's an abstraction layer, so it shouldn't concern you. Yeah, <laughs> theoretically, right? Uh, we copy the, so, so uh, if you mem remember the, uh, the, the context, the build context, we copy the sources from change to from, from the context into the container or into the image. Uh, we install with Maven install. Um, we provide, so in this case, we provide a volume for target. So, so if you guys have worked with Java before, target is where you know, all the test results are in. So as soon as we started the computation, a ch uh, files that change all the time or are produced or generated uh, should be in the volume because uh, you should not increase the container in size. And then we have an entry point, which is in that, in that case very simple. Again, it's Maven test. We just run the tests, and that uh, allows us to start the analysis. Oops. All right. So the exact <laughs> commands for that would be docker build, and, and then uh, I provide a name for that, Jurgen Cito, change to Ziller, and docker run again. In, in this case, I give the name uh, CD. And for that, I just prepared a little video because otherwise it would take too long. So uh, to give you a glance here, we, s we do Docker build. And then if you see the steps here, let's do a quick pause here. So for every step we have here, we add a layer to, to the image in the container. Okay. 
So every command that we have in the Docker file is one step, and each step is adding a layer. Uh, and those, those steps slash layers are cached. So let's say you have a very similar Docker file somewhere else, uh, and you inherit from image, for instance, then uh, the, the building ta is a slower process because uh, those steps are cached b before. No, because you, st you started an image. No, no. I mean, you cannot start a Java. Java needs to be. Right, but. We yeah, yeah. So I can just scroll a little bit further here. So it basically in installs the whole thing, right? And then here uh, we run Maven install. Okay. All right, build success, awesome. And now we, we execute the last steps, being the volume, for instance, and successfully built. So now we have an image. Now something that, and now what I can do is, oh yeah, there we can see we have this image called JC to change the siller. And what I could do now is I could say push this to to any kind of registry, be it Docker Hub or the Quay Hub or the Amazon Hub or your own local university's hub, and then someone else can go in and, and, and say, okay, I want to try this out, and then the only thing they have to do is say, docker pull JC to change the seller and have it on their local machine. And then uh, to actually execute this, what I do is I say docker run, and then run already knows what to do. It knows what kind of analysis to start. In this case, very simple, just Maven test, but it can be any, any kind of command that you need to start your analysis for your experiment or for your tool. So the steps that you need to actually reproduce the fact, reproduce the experiment, would be docker pull, get me that image, and then docker run, start the analysis. And then you're done. And this is the, the container right here. Okay, so that was it from, from the demo part. Uh, just a quick recap on the challenges that, that I posed in the, in the beginning of the talk. So we said there's no standard way of describing those experiments and those workflows and the environment. Um, so that could be the Docker image. Docker image could be this one standardized unit that you pull and then, then you can actually execute the, the experiment. Um, I said that there's no tra even if you have a VM, there's no transparency as to how you got to that point. Well, that could be the Docker file, because you step by step explain how you get to that environment and to this uh, execution um, environment to get to that fact. And the nature of our, of research code makes it hard to build stuff. Well, it's it's actually even built. So if you have an image to to make a container out of that, that's the easiest thing in the world. So you just say Docker run. And that's it. And uh, for infrastructure and, and distribution, I mean, uh, maybe something that the university hosts or something like a standard <coughs> entity is better. What we have right now is things like Docker Hub or Quay or Amazon that offer uh, those registries, but you can host one yourself. So if your university says we're going to invest in reproducibility with this container technology, you can host this reg registry yourself on the university website. And uh, and yeah, I'm not sure if that's the best solution, but right. But if if l let's say um, I'm in a European project right now, if let's say the EU would say we're gonna host a registry for all the European projects, that might be a solution. Oh yeah. So and all the unresolved and undocumented dependencies. Um, well, at least you have if you have a Docker file, you have exactly a list of dependencies that you have in the end. And then we come to limitations that we briefly discussed before. Uh, if you have, if you really depend on, on the performance results, then containers m might be, not, might not be the, the thing for you. And there's a paper that, that I'm listing here, it's called The Role of Container Technology in Computer Systems Research, and they go into the grits and details of, of how much you can get out of containers 
uh, with performance. Um, and the biology world has looked a lot into Docker because uh, they have a lot more problems when it comes to reproducibility. And uh, at least um, this one, one uh, source here says it's not, not enough for data intensive workloads. Oh yeah, I mean, and this is like, because you, as soon as you have an image, you can go, five minutes? Okay, cool. So you can go into the image and can see what's happening inside. If you're working with proprietary software um, and there's some licensing issues or IP issues, then Docker cannot help, or any container technology cannot help you. Because uh, there's transpa transparency involved in the whole process. Thus, um, if you work with proprietary software, it might be tricky. And I mean, the same goes for NDAs and, and intellectual property. And I mean, yeah, we talked about this in, in quite some length before. Uh, can we build the same artifact with the same specification in 10 years, 15, 20 years? Uh, is Docker going to be the same? Are containers going to be the same? Um, we talked about this before. There's this OCI, the Open Container Initiative, uh, and they tried to standardize the whole thing. And I feel that so many companies right now are invested in, in, this, technolo in this technology. Uh, there might be hope that it's going to be working in a couple of years because we have all this legacy software built on it. So that's it from my side. Um, just a quick glimpse into how we could use containers to, to improve reproducibility. Uh, just to leave you with two sentences, I, I think containers can enable uh, a fast and easy way to describe your environment and your experiments. And uh, at best, it helps your future self if you work with some software again in a half a year, or reviewers, or maybe other researchers, so your paper gets cited a lot more. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, I don't know, probably not that much time left. Uh, I'll be in the hallway, of course. And uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>